welcome you to this special interview with Dr. Steve Keen. Dr. Keen is professor of economics at the University of Western Sydney in Australia. He is the author of the book Debunking Economics, now in its second edition. And I'd just like to welcome him to the 2012 conference, international conference on sustainability, transition, and culture change, vision, action, leadership. How are you doing today, Steve? <laughs> well, today is now about 40 hours long for me since I started at Bangkok at half past midnight, and it's now, what, uh, 6.30 in Michigan. So, a uh, very elongated day. I think I'm still moderately alive. Sorry to say, but it's actually 7.30 today. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if I feel so tired. <laughs> so, um, Steve, what were you doing in Bangkok? I was actually at two United Nations conferences, one for the uh, United Nations Environment Program and the other for what's called the Economic and Social Committee for Asia and the Pacific, uh, ESCAP is its nickname, and they both are having conferences effectively on the quality of growth. So you know that, of course, the only region of the world that's been growing uh, strongly economically for the last, well, th three decades, but certainly even after the financial crisis has been the Asian region. And uh, <clears throat> the point of view of the, uh, the uh, Asian elites effectively is that growth uh, will continue for some time. They're talking about calling the 21st century the Asian century. But of course they're now seeing dilemmas about pollution, uh, inequality as well on a fairly massive scale. And now some of the, both the formal groups like the United Nations and a group of community areas as well as saying we need to look not just at the rate of growth and the level of growth, but the quality of growth. So that was the focus of these two conferences. Were these, were, were the two conferences, the, the goal was to try to figure out how to <coughs> increase <coughs> growth in the in Asia, basically? Not to increase it, no, because it, I mean, you're looking at China growing at a rate which is truly unsustainable for an indefinite period. China has been recording a rate of growth of close to 10% per annum. Now, you grow at 10% per annum, you double every seven years. You try a number of so doubles on doubles and doubles and doubles and doubles, and you get to the stage where your country is the size of the known universe, so it can't be sustained. Um, but it's grown from, a, if you look back when, when China began growing in 1980, 81, when they kicked out the um, fairly Stalinist regime they had beforehand and went for more of a market system, they were growing from a very low base. And they've grown very dramatically by effectively transferring a large amount of technology from the West to China and very intelligent programs to encourage foreign investment and so on. Uh, what that caused is a huge imbalance in growth, very successful and enormous growth in cities like Shanghai, uh, Beijing, the, the Shenzhen area, dr dramatic. Uh, economic growth there. They're literally building a city, I, I think they're building something of the order of a city to house the population of my country every every year. So six cities the size of Sydney a year are being built effectively in that country. So phenomenal scale of growth. But what you are seeing is, for, is huge income disparities. Uh, you're seeing the, the social, uh, uh, having been based on low wage um, costs for so long you now have the <coughs> a breakout of Chinese wages occurring. There's now sufficiently high employment that workers can demand wage rises, but you've got institutions like Foxconn, which makes iPads and so on. We all would have Foxconn products on our tables here at this conference. <coughs> Being run in such a militaristic way that you're now getting uh, workers protesting by measures as extreme as committing political suicide and doing a suicide for political reasons. So quite bizarre social conflicts building up there. And there's now a realisation they can't just continue growing as they have grown, where it's been growth at a massive rate and, and just aim for the maximum level of growth, don't care about the distribution, and also growth without a great deal of regard for the environment. So there's now those realisation they have to improve um, the distribution of income coming out of growth, and they have to also improve uh, reduce the impact on the environment because of that's becoming very extreme in parts of China in particular. But a huge scale environmental damage and they're now also seeing the, the dangers of the global, general global warming as well. That is affecting 
their agriculture, their reliability, their rainfall systems. Uh, so there's a serious realization of a need to change the nature of growth and focus more on the quality and transformation of reducing waste and so on, rather than growing and not caring about the level of waste being generated. Were there many talks? It was Shanghai you were in? No, it's just in, in Bangkok. Bangkok. Yeah. Were there many talks about um, climate change then and environmental issues? Yeah. And was it primarily economists at this conference? Or uh, what it was sort a, of people were there? It's a, there were very, very much in internal UN conferences. So it was United Nations uh, representatives uh, working in Bangkok and then people from around the region, so people from China, India, uh, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, Singapore, uh, who are formal representatives, um, Kazakhstan, quite a range of, of nations represented. And it, it was fairly bureaucratic in the nature of the conference because you're saying how do our bureaucracies manage to encourage other parts of the system to uh, you know, promote more green development or how do we measure the level of damage we're doing to the ecology, for example. So a major part of what I was doing there was working with the uh, Australian organisation called the CSIRO, which stands for the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation. And they've been developing technology, uh, computer technology, to be able to measure the materials flows in different countries. So if you work out what your output is, it's also working what the inputs are, what the material flows are, and then seeing uh, what degree of waste is being generated as well, what you're doing to the sustainability of your forest, for example, if you're you know, building construction materials at the rate they're building in China, then what are you doing to your stocks of forests? And they can actually, with the, with the databases we're developing, uh, measure then, if you put that trend forward, how long will the stock of far harvestable forests last? Whereas my work, of course, is on financial dynamics and how the financial system feeds into uh, the productive economy. And we're looking at getting a, a large part of trying to make growth sustainable is actually being able to measure what's happening right now. And the reality is that we simply do not uh, know how at the moment, we don't, we don't have the technology to measure the nature in which we're growing or the sustainability of it. So we're trying to get the, those organisations to, to fund us to develop the technologies we've started to build at a very uh, basic level to the stage where we can actually comprehensively say, what are you doing to your environment by the rate of growth you're achieving right now? How sustainable is that? And when could you face problems if you don't reorient your growth pattern? You were here at the conference last year. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, what have been, um, what has been your work in the last year? What have you been up to? Uh, um, one of the problems about being a sole operator is I do every, everything myself. I've now got a group of supporters helping out to some extent, but a huge part of my life just goes in the mechanics of managing to stay alive and doing, uh, running my blogs and so on. But I've started a new uh, subscription blog, which the idea, idea of that is to try to raise funds to support maybe both the clerical support and, and research staff. That's working fairly well. I quite like being a, I've started a business class in the plane. I've still got economy as my debt watch site. Okay? <laughs> but the idea is to get people willing to pay more for a more polished product to be able to help them fund my, my research because I get no funding from my university. Uh, that's that's at the, the, the nuts and bolts level. Technically, I've been working on building software packages that enable me to model monetary dynamics more accurately. So the package I call Minsky, as, which I be, be, had begun working on last year, is now at the stage where it's usable. I can use it to demonstrate monetary dynamics to people in general, and I can also use it for actual research purposes. So, for example, it was possible recently to say, if you actually build a multi-bank system, what is the relationship between reserves and lending? And I've, I've confirmed the usual post-Keynesian argument that reserves play no role in lending, but I've clarified it as well, because when you, if you the, the usual story of money creation tells you, you deposit money in a bank, the bank then hands on to a fraction of that, lends out the rest, et cetera, et cetera. That's physically impossible, and I can demonstrate that using a Minsky program. However, if banks have to borrow off other banks to balance their own internal transactions of money, they can lend borrowed reserves. So 
that, is, that therefore means there is a channel by which reserves make it into the lending process, but it's not through deposited reserves, it's through borrowed reserves. So being able to clarify elements like that, was, that's a major improvement of what I can do analytically using the Minsky program. And this summer, um, I saw you in Toronto. Mm. What were you doing in Toronto, and what were the? Was there any follow-on from that, yeah. or what did you discover or yeah. learn? Or? Well, this is, this is one of the great uh, great boons recently. Out of the blue, I got an email saying from a, a, a professor of mathematics in uh, McMaster University in in Canada, saying he's publishing a paper on, on the Keene model of financial instability. Model. The Keen model, so uh, which is my 1995 paper on Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, analysing mathematically the characteristics of that model. Now I'd done that myself uh, while doing my PhD, but I'd never published it. So when you build a mathematical model, uh, you can characterise its behaviours in a range of ways. Uh, the simplest way is to say what equilibria value is it has. More complex is to talk about the stability of the equilibria, and then it's uh, saying. Uh, what they call the basins of attraction, where you might, might fall to one the equilibrium or go to another, uh, what breakdowns can occur and so on. So they've done a detailed paper on that, on that front. And the, the, that was probably the, the benefit actually of last year was this whole discovery in Toronto because Toronto is home to what's called the Fields Institute. Did anybody hear of the field, heard of the Fields Medal? Okay, the, there is no, there's no, no Nobel Prize for mathematics, but the equivalent is the Fields Medal in mathematics for a mathematician under the age of 40. Now the Fields Institute doesn't actually award it, though it does hand out that medal, but it's named after the same person. And it's the world's leading applied, or one of the world's leading applied mathematics research centres. So this has a small group of mathematicians there, a large support staff, and what they have is a fantastic facility for conferences and, and uh, networking. And they will have up to any particular time up to five different colloquia running where they'll bring in, say, 20 or 50 major researchers, some mathematicians, some physicists, uh, economists, biologists, medical people, whatever they're working on, and they'll have a colloquium on, for example, the mathematics of the heart, or the mathematics of, uh, of water, throw, water flow through uh, geological structures, et cetera, et cetera. So those colloquiums bring together people and combine specialists in a particular area with mathematicians who can then show them how to improve what they're doing with the extra knowledge a mathematician can bring. Now the beauty is the Fields Institute, I have always regarded the Fields Institute as one of the homes of neoclassical economics because the, a, a huge part of the work to develop neoclassical modelling was done via the Fields Institute because the, they would, you know, there are mathem applied mathematicians helping out biologists, helping out medical people, helping out people working in laser, uh, technology. Let's talk about the economists as well. Yeah. Well, they organised a colloquium in 2010 on financial economics, beginning organising in 2005. So they had a bunch of economists, the world's leading mathematical economists, sitting around a room you know, about twice this size and talking away about the uh, mathematical models of the economy. And the mathematicians of the field you said, so what caused the financial crisis? I don't know. What do you think? I'm not joking, that was about the calibre of what they got back. They had no, all these mathematical economists had no idea why the crisis occurred, had no solutions whatsoever about how to get over it. And the mathematicians were saying, what's going on here? We thought you guys were the experts on the economy. So one of them then asked a, a Fields uh, medalist, who, not a Fields medalist, but a field, uh, a leading person from the Fields Institute who had established a major a consultancy in mathematical finance, uh, does anybody in economics know about cycles? And he said, yeah, you should read Kindleberger. So this guy read Kindleberger, and Kindleberger's first chapter talks about Hyman Minsky. So he said, the mathematician reading through Minsky thinking, this is interesting, convincing stuff, logical argument, it must be mainstream, so I'll go and find, you know, there must be plenty of models of Minsky in, in the economic literature, I'll go looking for them. Now it's not his opinion, it's not my opinion, it's his opinion. He said there was only one, which is my model. Um, I, there's about 20 people who have done models of Minsky, but all of them have made various compromises. They've either worked in discrete time, which I think is the wrong framework, 
or they've limited it to two dimensions, which actually makes it impossible mathematically to generate Minsky's own behavior. So according to Matthias, I had the only model. And suddenly, mathematicians who'd normally been helping build neoclassical stuff are now saying, hey, there's a whole different approach out here that makes much more sense. We should build them, develop that. So I've now got a, not just Matthias, but a whole range of mathematicians who are working on the non-neoclassical, non-equilibrium approach that I take to economics. And it, I think it's, fan, it's a fantastic possibility. But the, again, they didn't know there was another way to do mathematical economics. They thought the economists had worked out that equilibrium was the right organizing principle. Seems strange to them, but you know, <laughs> they must know what they're doing. Well, then the crisis happens and they don't know what they're doing, so suddenly the mathematicians are on the side of critics of conventional economic theory. Now, um, as a little bit of preview of tomorrow, mm. uh, you're going to be around all day tomorrow, mm. but you have to leave very early on the next day. Mm. And so tomorrow, um, you have a one-hour talk in the morning, mm -hmm. and then you have a one-hour talk in the afternoon. Mm. And also, around lunchtime, that might be a really good time to have some question and answer yep. from anybody that might have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that sounds like a good plan for tomorrow. Is that okay yep, with you? Yep, suits me fine. Yep. And then um, I think before we wrap up tonight, um, there's one burning question, which is in the United States here, uh, in the news in, since the election, the presidential election, the only thing I've been hearing out of Washington, D.C. is about the fiscal cliff. Mm. And I'm wondering, first of all, what is the fiscal cliff? Mm. And number two, what's your take on what we're hearing from the politicians about the fiscal cliff? And um, I guess the third thing is, you know, what's, what's your, your professional analysis of this fiscal cliff? Okay, well, fiscal cliff uh, is simply a, first of all, an expiry of a range of tax cuts. And secondly, a, across the board, um, indiscriminate, about 2% cut in government expenditure across a whole range of uh, different portfolios. I think they've excluded defences, is almost always the case. But 2% cuts in funding for all departments, if uh, these, the particular uh, uh, law isn't overturned, I think in about, about 48 days, it's about that close. And it reflects the previous impasse under the, under the previous um, electoral arrangement where the Republicans were you know, stonewalling uh, Obama's policies all the way through Congress. And because they couldn't reach a compromise about what they called the debt ceiling, which was the, uh, the level, the maximum level that the government was allowed to get to, uh, then I, I, to Congress passed a, a, pol a policy, that, a motion that meant that if they didn't have a, a organized way to reduce government debt, within a year's time, then at that point an automatic 2% cut would be applied across all uh, portfolios. And that would be a bit like instantly trying to turn America into Greece, from my point of view. It's an insane idea. But if you have the usual level of political logjam that applies in Washington, it'll happen because both parties will fail to reach an agreement and what sits on the statute books will come into effect. I think they actually will reach a compromise. I think they will actually manage to delay it and there'll be some compromise rule about um, reducing the rate of growth of public debt but not actually cutting public expenditure by 2% on a particular day. Um, what, when is actually the end? Is it the end of this year? Pardon? Yeah, yeah, well, happy, yeah happy new year if they actually pull it off. So I think the one part that I wasn't clear on was um, as far as your economic modeling, yeah. the, um, the Minsky model and the Keen model mm. and uh, non-orthodox non modeling, what would, what would, yeah. what, why don't you just elaborate a little bit on what okay. would be the well, impact of if this went, if this fiscal yeah. cliff occurred? Yeah, we have, I have to go back to saying where, the, where does the crisis come from to begin with? And we have a financial crisis caused by excessive levels of private debt. So a huge private debt bubble, which has been going on in America, really 
pretty much the end of the Second World War, but distinctly as a rate of growth of private debt exceeding the rate of growth of the economy, um, becoming serious from the, the mid-1980s on. So you had private debt beginning at 45% of GDP back in 1945 and reaching 303% in 2009. Now it's declining through people and foreclosures, wiping out a large part of household debt, the financial sector deliberately paying its debt down. So you've fallen from about 300% of GDP to 250% of GDP. Now, the reason this has led to an economic crisis is that total spending in an economy is a sum of income plus change in debt. Now, I, I will probably actually go through and prove why that's not double counting tomorrow because I get a lot of people who think it's double counting and I've proven mathematically it's that it is not double counting to say expenditure is income plus change in debt. But what that means is when you've got debt, private debt rising, the expenditure exceeds incomes. So it gives you a, that's a this recipe for a booming economy. When you have debt being paid down, expenditure is less than income and that gives you a depressed economy. So you've got people actually taking money out of circulation by paying the debt down, reducing the amount of money in the economy and reducing demand at the same time. Hence the slump America's been in since 2008. Now, if the, when that happens, because private sector spending, when private sector spending falls, normally government spend, net spending rises because for a start, the tax revenues fall and their welfare payments rise. So government spending tends to go in the opposite direction. So the, the increase in government debt has been a response to a turnaround from rising private debt boosting demand to declining private debt undercutting demand. So it's a bit like a, I mean, my best analogy is always an a, a air conditioning system. If you have a room which is uh, freezing, then the air conditioner comes on to warm it up. And that's effectively the government spending role in that system. Now, what they're suggesting is the room's freezing and let's drop the temperature. Okay? Let's take more money out of the system than the private sector's removing by also removing government money from the system. So what actually you do, you reduce the amount of money in circulation and reduce the level of aggregate demand. And that is supposed to be the solution to a problem where there's not enough aggregate demand. Okay? So it's easy to make the mistake of believing that's sensible because people extrapolate forward the idea about a household budget. And if you're spending more than you earn as a household, you've got to cut back on your spending and we all you know, fall for that sort of reasoning. When you apply it at the household level, if you cut back on your spending, it doesn't mean you lose your job. Okay? But if you do it at a national level, if you have the entire society trying to reduce the rate of turnover of money, and reduce the amount of money in circulation, it will reduce the number of jobs as well. So it's, not, it, it, it's, it's, it's the wrong policy because it's focusing on the wrong type of debt. It's trying to reduce public debt when the real problem is caused by pretty much private debt. And it would be imposing austerity in the belief austerity will cause growth. Now the best example I can give of how successful that policy is, is Greece followed slightly by Spain. With England not too far behind, well a long way behind actually, but yeah, surely now looking at those examples, you can say those are countries that have tried austerity and tried cutting government spending. What a fantastic <laughs> success it was. All right, Steve. Well, I think that's a great teaser for tomorrow, and I know you need to get some rest tonight. Um, again, this is Dr. Steve Keen. He's professor of economics at the University of Western Sydney in Australia. His book is Debunking Economics, now in its second edition, and we'll bid you a farewell from the International Conference on Sustainability, Transition, and Culture Change, Vision, Action, Leadership. Thank you very much. <laughs>